So I now want to introduce my very good friend, my hero, Jeremy, the founder of Solar Century, the founder of Solar Aid, the chair of Carbon Tracker. Carbon Tracker has been the most important initiative in the NGO sector in the last year to drive change amongst investors and governments around investments in climate change related industries and industries that close down coal and oil. It's been incredibly influential. It's spawned 350.org, for example. He's also the author of a book which is currently being serialised online in the old fat tradition of Thomas Hardy called Winning the Carbon War. Really worth, really worth reading. He's an inspirational strategist. He's an oil engineer, by the way. He has a dark past from the 1980s. But he saw the light in the late 80s and went to work for Greenpeace. And I first came across him, and I don't know if he knows this, in the early 90s, when I read some of the writings of Greenpeace he did about engaging the insurance sector. And I thought, because at the time I was involved in Greenpeace, later became a board member, I thought, at last, at last, a proper strategy for change. <coughs> engaging where the money is. He got a bit embittered at the time, because whilst insurance companies came to the party with rhetorical statements of support and climate service, they didn't actually change their investment behaviour. And he went on to do something incredible after that founding Solar Century. But I want to know, that the, want you to know that the UN Climate Summit this year, we had a big win. The two big insurance associations representing $18 trillion came out of statements saying they were going to multiply by two their climate-related investments this year and multiply by 10 by 2020. That's actually, that's actually the first substantive shift in the campaign Jeremy started in the early 90s on the investment side. One of those has joined our board because they're looking for help to figure out what is green. Go figure. The point is the opportunities to get investors now are stronger and better than ever before because of a long play campaign that Jeremy started in the early 90s. Incredibly important campaign. I want to welcome him to the stage today. He's on my advisory panel. He's a friend and, as I said, one of my heroes in growing this campaign. I'm very keen to hear what he's got to say. And uh, I'm not sure he's going to read out excerpts of his book or whatever. Please, Jeremy, come to the stage. Well, thank you, Sean, and I shall try to live up to 5% of that. Um, I've been asked to talk about solar, a disruptive industry in a volatile, a disruptive technology in a volatile energy industry. And of course, everyone here knows that we are disruptive. We are highly disruptive um, of an incumbency, mostly in fossil fuels. That is, is not gonna just sit back and uh, watch what's happening without having words to say. Um, it is a volatile energy industry, we all know this too, um, painfully so. But it's not us that's volatile, it's them and the oil price story, the drama that's unfolding at the moment, says everything you need to know about that contrast between the volatility of the oil price and, and the solar price. So, um, for people like me, after all these years, you know, a quarter of a century bashing my head against a, a brick wall, um, the last few years have been fascinating and, and I'm full of cautious optimism about the future. Um, I see this as a civil war. It, it looks and feels like a civil war to me. Um, and the argument that I hope to put over this morning is that actually we're winning. The solar industry is in the process of, of, of winning the carbon war. The book that Sean mentioned you can download free from jeremyleggett.net. Jeremy Leggett, all one word. Uh, let me just spend a, a, a second justifying this because people say to me, oh, come on, man, you're being uh, too melodramatic here. There are no bullets. People aren't dying. Actually, people are dying already from the impacts of uh, enhanced climate change, as, as Sean said. But here's a couple of sort of vignettes as to what we're, we're dealing with. This is an article from the New York Times um, featuring a lobbyist for the carbon fuel industry who was at a retreat with senior executives one of them was so troubled by what he was hearing that he actually secretly filmed it. The New York Times ran an, uh, ran an article. Um, this man, it doesn't matter who he is because there are actually a good few folk like this, was urging the executives to win ugly or lose pretty. 
think of this as an endless war, he said. And he's talking about the solar industry, he's talking about electric vehicles, and all the rest of it. So this kind of thing doesn't come without budgets, and there are budgets, and there are storyboards in PR companies. I know this because people tell me from within the PR companies, and this quote here, they are using black arts to try and kill you. That was a very senior PR executive um, in one of the scenes in a previous book, uh, taking me out for coffee, guilt-stricken, and telling me um, what's going on. And of course, what you see is in the papers all the time, 80% of the press coverage of us and wind is negative, despite the popularity that we have with publics. So why are we in danger of winning? Uh, the, 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 argument, the argument quickly is that there are three emerging mega trends that we're benefiting from. They're separate from each other, but um, they all point in our direction. Our insurgency has a cost down mega trend. Theirs has a cost up mega trend on the whole. I'm generalizing, but I think fairly. Uh, and there is environmental action breaking over all, all over in the governmental world, in the corporate world, and in civil society. So let's look at ours. Um, well, you know, you've all seen this diagram before from Alliance Bernstein. We love to show it, and it's potent because it shows our cost down against the life cycles of typical fossil fuel projects, be it an oil field or a centralized power plant, 30, 40 years. And you see their cost pretty low, bubbling along the bottom there. And ours didn't figure until 2006, way up at the top of the diagram, then what they call the terror dome. Why that graphic expression from sober financial analysts? Because of the terror it strikes into the hearts of those protecting, trying to protect the traditional business models. And this isn't just about us and solar on the ground and in rooftops, it's about transportation. We knew this in Solar Century a fair while ago because with SSE we, we did a great little set of installations with the solar roof tiles, all the electricity provided in um, that development with our roof tiles, plenty left over to charge the community electric vehicle. Um, and of course, you know, the wire's only going one way in that picture, but in the future they'll be going both ways. UBS um, is the report, among all the reports, that if I'm forced to just have one prop to persuade people, it's that great report by the UBS team urging their investors to join the solar revolution. Now, you won't be able to see this too far back, um, but if you don't know the report, do have a quick look at it. These are the summary diagrams. You can see the trends. Lithium battery costs down, actual, already, and projected after the gigawatt fab gets going and all the rest of the plants in train. EU EV sales going up and not even reaching 10% before the real fundamental disruption happens. And that disruption happens as soon as the end of this decade, because by 2020, if these guys are halfway right, you'll be able to have a solar roof, you'll be able to have an electric vehicle, big bank of batteries in your house doing all your electricity, your capital cost payback will be just over seven years, and most <coughs> important of all, you'll be getting 7% annual return pre-tax. And that is going to get people investing in their own pensions at home, on their own roofs, in their own yards. This is going to change the face of the energy industry. They say in ways that most of us cannot even imagine. This is by 2020. And you don't need to go too far to find other evidence that that is the case. April last year, I'm sure many of you, like me, looked at um, Apple's adverts on the back of virtually every newspaper in the world. Full page, full color. Um, there are some ideas we want every com company to follow, uh, to copy. And, you know, you sort of, this isn't a Johnny Ive funky design thing they're talking about here. It's a good old box standard solar farm. And this is Apple. And you think, what on earth are they thinking about? And I did have a wild thought then. It has to be some sort of mass market use. It has to involve self-interest. This is Apple. This is not one of the front runners of environmental and social performance. And of course, last week we found out what it was. They've had 300 people working uh, on how to mass produce functionally designed electronic ve electric vehicles by 2020. Now, we don't know what's going to happen for sure, but we know that that uh, plan is in place in a company like Apple. You just got to look at what Google are doing in solar and energy. And if you are an incumbency executive, and I spent last night at dinner with very senior incumbency executives, you are quaking in your boots. Or 
working out how to change your business model quickly. And this is realized, of course, in the press. This is the Telegraph. Um, of course, I could show you the Guardian, but, but the, the Telegraph, the international, the senior international business editor, <coughs> Ambrose Evans Critchard, um, and his headline, Global Solar Dominance Insight as Science Trumps Fossil Fuels. And, you know, in this current war, latterly, there have been many mornings where I've woken up, seen things like this, and thought, you know, life is stranger than art. How could you have imagined that this would be on the business pages of the Daily Telegraph? Mr. Cameron and Mr. Osborne see this global solar dominance. And we are already seeing the beginnings of the turn. Right now in Stuttgart, just imagine what executives of many of your age and experience um, are doing. The wars will be covered with flip charts and post-it notes because the board has decided without knowing how to do it to back out of fossil fuels and nuclear. Uh, you will know this happened in December and they're going to focus all their growth uh, potential on renewables, solar and all the rest of it. And they've left it to the more junior execs to work out how to do that switch, that 180 degree turn in business model. They're the first we haven't seen this happen in the oil and gas industry yet. My prediction is we're going to within three years. Uh, they're not, not going to have any choice. And what we have to remind ourselves all the time, you know, about disruption. We don't often see <laughs> fundamental disruption. Uh, but when it happens, it happens fast and hard. Uh, and, you know, the motor car is a good example. Uh, Fifth Avenue in New York in 1900, stop the car. Fifth Avenue in New York, 1930, spot the horse. That uh, was a painful experience for the horse industry. Emerging mega trend two, their incumbency cost up. Now this is why the oil and gas industry are going nowhere. This is their top um, 11 quoted companies. This is their capital expenditure outlay in exploration and production since 2000. The red line going up. The gray line going down since 2005 is their actual oil found and produced. Where is that business model heading? They, of course, say they can reverse that downward trend. Um, others doubt that. And this isn't just a, a problem of the top 11. This is a global problem. Carbon Tracker that uh, Sean mentioned uh, produced a report in June where we looked for the first time at the carbon cost curve of all the oil reserves and resources being turned into reserves with current CapEx programs in the world. Never been done before. And if you haven't seen that report, I do commend it to you. Main conclusion was that above an oil price of $95, there were more than a trillion dollars of capital expenditure um, at risk. And we just soberly put that over. In uh, December last year, Goldman Sachs did the same exercise. They used somewhat more graphic language. A trillion dollars of zombie investments out there in oil and gas. Um, and uh, that was above an oil price of $70 a barrel. Anyone know what the oil price is today? I don't. Uh, so that's a question. Somebody must have written Financial Times. About 59, I think. Yeah, right, thanks. So, you know, this is an industry in, in, uh, in deep trouble, and it has other problems. Uh, institutions are divesting left, right, and center. So far, $50 billion has been divested completely out of fossil fuels by foundations, um, financial institutions, pension funds, and of course cities, campuses, doctors, and the churches. The, the carbon fuels are in the process of being stigmatized in society in the same way tobacco is. And again, you know, uh, you can't invent this stuff. This is the Telegraph. Sorry, you're going to think I vote conservative and read the Telegraph every morning. Um, Fossil fuel industry is the subprime danger of this cycle. Senior international business business said that. Isn't he over, overstating it? Isn't this just a bit melodramatic? No. In December, we learned the Bank of England has an internal inquiry as to whether or not the fossil fuel industries pose a systemic threat to the stability of the global financial markets in the same way that mortgage-backed securities and all the ridiculous games that uh, investment banks and others played with them proved to in um, the noughties. Final megatrend then um, is the emerging concern in civil society and the response to that politically. 
Anyone who saw, so climate change is back on the streets now. This is the biggest climate um, demonstration in the world, and it was in New York in December last year. Anyone who saw that uh, would have had no doubt that there was something stirring in society. Um, and here's Fifth Avenue again with the demonstration going down in the polar bear um, taking part, um, apropos Sean's comment, and lo and behold, as the in, uh, protesters approach Wall Street, what's that floating above their heads but a carbon bubble, the, um, the amount of carbon that cannot be burned if we're to stay below two degrees uh, Celsius, according to Carbon Tracker, the International Energy Agency, and others. So climate's back on the front pages in a way that it hasn't been since the disastrous Copenhagen Climate Summit in 2009. Um, and it's very likely to stay there given this kind of thing. Um, it, again, on the war theme, um, no one's being shot, but you know it really is reminiscent of things I saw as a youth in the Vietnam War demonstrations, lots of young people passionate about the subject being arrested by the New York Police Department, even the polar bear. And apropos um, life being stranger than art, the New York Police Department succeeded in deflating the carbon bubble. Let's hope that's an allegory for our future and a soft landing. How did they do it? They punctured it on the horns of the Merrill Lynch bull on Wall Street. I mean, could Ben Elton even possibly invent this stuff? So, um, you know, naturally it's resonating. President Obama in his speech at the summit, we cannot pretend we don't hear them, referring to the people on the streets. Uh, the bilateral deal with China, which has re-energized the climate negotiations, making many of us, you know, very um, optimistic about what was going to happen in Paris. Um, and so, just in closing, I, I do think, you know, we have a central, vital role in all this, obviously because of the technologies that we have um, and what we're doing with them and the generally amazing job that this industry is doing. What I don't think we're doing well is engaging in the political and social part of the um, discussion. And so that would be my appeal uh, to in leaders in the industry today. I've written an open letter um, that's going up on the website. I won't elaborate, but just two final thoughts um, take, for example, engagement in the shale debate. Uh, this is vital for us because here's Mr. Mesraye, um, CEO of GDF Suez. Uh, gas can do everything, including heating and electricity. Um, what's he want to do? End all subsidies for solar, wind, and everything else. This is their policy. Um, and uh, where's this top fracking prospect? The UK. And this is a serious battleground because what's happening in America right now is that this industry is, is self-combusting. It's in the process of bankrupting itself. They're losing money hand over fist. This is one of the reasons why the Bank of England is investigating. And, you know, we, we know this. Bloomberg are reporting on it. Is the U.S. shale boom going bust? This was at $100 oil. Uh, if it um, is going bust, then what's happening now? And as for us in England, um, we should be able to deconstruct this myth. This is a mile of drilling the red spots of wells in Texas. This is a mile of rural Kent and Sussex in the Weald. Across those two top scenes, that's about a mile. Imagine all those wells. Uh, that's what the government currently wants to do. That's in their energy policy. Um, if that didn't exist, and it shouldn't exist because it's madness, uh, we would be doing even better in solar. And this is how, sorry, my phone, and this is how we can uh, really defeat it because of the lorry movements. That's what's going to do for this. That is a sweet spot shale drilling in America and the lorry movements, toxics and water in, oil and gas out. Never going to happen in this country. So uh, finally, uh, Please consider one other thing, which is joining a 5% club. In Solar Century, we donate 5% of our profits to Solar Aid, a charity every year that um, does solar lighting in Africa, sells solar lights, recycles the profits. We've saved with the lights a million and a half that we've deployed so far, 200 million for households. Um, we've saved a million and a half tons of carbon dioxide and so forth. If one 
middleweight solar company can do this with 5% of its profits with a lead retailer in the whole of Africa operating out of only two countries. Just imagine what we could do as an industry if we ganged up together. And this is my favorite, the extra homework hours that are generated by these solar lights. Final um, minute of the talk. Uh, this is the kind of thing we need as an industry to be doing our equivalent of. This is a video, I'm not going to show it to you, but this is a video the oil industry produced. That little thing there um, is an oil barrel with the pink bow, and she's about to be dumped by her boyfriend, uh, ill-advisedly, because in the video, if you haven't seen it, he ends up freezing in the dark, in a cave, <laughs> without any clothes. This is how crude, if you will forgive me, uh, the incumbency has become in its desperation to avoid what is coming down the track at it. This is the kind of thing I think we ought, perhaps, to be doing. Um, it's been produced by the youth group for climate change. It's one minute long. My ex is a fossil fuel. I know. What was I thinking, right? One day be up, the next down. So volatile. He didn't exactly scream long term to me. He was just so dirty. And not in a good way. We broke up because he just lived in a complete fantasy world. Such a great guy. But then it just kind of came really clear that actually he was crumbling. We both had really contrasting views on what we wanted our futures to look like. He was just so insecure. He always had to trash everybody else. Before I knew it, there'd be some new disaster he just wouldn't take any responsibility for. Yeah, I just woke up one day and realised, like, it's not worth being with someone who's just morally bankrupt. I mean, he said he was going to clean up his act, but it was a total lie. Whilst it might make life quite convenient, um, he might go on about how, how on earth would I get on without him. Actually, you know, there's loads of other alternatives. <laughs> You know, you've written this win in the carbon war, carbon war serial, Tom and ha Thomas Hardy style serial, with this idea that you're getting optimistic. You're getting optimistic. So does this mean you've had a big turn? Because a year ago you weren't particularly optimistic. So, so you know, what actually has happened? Yeah, it's, it's just been the, um, the, the march of events. Uh, there is so much that has happened in this last year that I didn't necessarily expect to see happen including, of course, our own uh, cost downtrend and its continuation and the innovation and finance and the way you get a sense of how the industry is going to keep growing at really disruptive rates globally, even though it has um, issues in, in some countries. So, yeah, I've, I've turned around. But the book is called The Winning of the Carbon War. It's not called How We Won the Carbon War. That's very important. <laughs> Uh, you know, if those of you know military history, we've, we've gone past El Alamein. Um, we're on the way to victory, but we could still yet lose. Um, and that's why I think the industry needs to get engaged, but, you know, at a more fundamental level than um, the routine day-to-day -day activities. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Good morning, Paul Camp from Electric and Big 60 Million. Um, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I've also been watching a television program about Planet Oil, which has been quite fascinating for me because I thought I knew quite a bit about oil. There's a great book called The End of Oil by Paul Roberts. Um, and, you know, I'm in the solar industry, but I just wondered what your perspective was given the fact that there are a lot of byproducts from oil that are also necessary. And I wondered uh, if the, uh, as another second question, um, if I may, um, I was at the climate change conference in Copenhagen. Uh, a lot of disparate people feeling very desperate. Um, and I just wondered what you think will happen in Paris and, and the subsequent sort of um, uh, fallout from that, please. What we have to um, help our colleagues in the oil and gas industry do is to get rid of the part that involves the burning. And I think um, if you look at the way they're digging in, Exxon, Shell, and BP in particular, um, they intend to burn it all, and they're rehearsing arguments as to how and why they think they're going to be able to. Much of that argumentation hinging around, well, actually, you know what, the world isn't going to do anything about this really materially, so our assets aren't at risk, stay with us. 
Well, they are at risk. I hope I persuaded you of that in, in the talk. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, we can be cautiously optimistic about Paris, because in Copenhagen, um, there was no preparation work. Governments weren't preparing the way they are for Paris, and they didn't have this um, lucky break. Actually, our mega trend of costs down has got nothing to do with climate change, and neither has the incumbency's mega trend of cost up. It's just simply that they're on all these ridiculous frontiers, and I only just touched on the problems they have. So that is going to help the negotiators. Um, and it's increasingly something that they realize, feel empowered by, and um, you know, we still have the best part of nine months between now and the, more than nine months between now and the, and the summit. And given the pace at which the drama has unfolded, this is one of the reasons why I've made the serialization book of the book live, given the pace that the drama has evolved at in the last year, um, Paris is still a long, long way away. Okay, well, last question just here. Hi, it's David Pickup from the Solar Trade Association. At the SDA and in the industry, we're starting to talk about grid parity and zero subsidy and all of those things. I'd just be interested to get your view on what is going to happen to the industry and I guess what the reaction would be from the incumbents at, at that point. I think we've, we've seen it with, with E.ON. That, that, was, that day, the 1st of December last year, was a seismic day. That was the day the Bank of England let it be known that it was um, launching this inquiry. Ergo, it sees risk, whatever the inquiry comes up with, it sees the potential for risk that the fossil fuel companies are and industries are a threat to the stability of the capital markets. And that was the same day, coincidentally, that E.ON announced the world that it was doing a 180 degree turn in its business model. I think they've got nowhere else to go and without betraying confidences, you know, I used to be one of them and I don't froth at the mouth, at least not in public. Um, and, uh, you know, I get invited in for co high-level contact sessions with these companies. There is a lot of soul-searching going on, uh, and, you know, I repeat my prediction. It won't be too long before the first oil and gas industry follows uh, what E.ON has done and says we're parking our legacy assets to run them for cash. We're not going to go exploring anymore. What's the point? We're just putting additional oil and gas into a bubble that likely can't be burnt or possibly can't be burnt. We're going to do other things in the clean energy future. Um, and that's the day, of course, that the checkbooks come out and a lot of people in this room become seriously rich. <laughs> Wonderful note to finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>